All right, everybody. Uh, this is Joel Hinman. Uh, I am director of the New York program here at the Writer's Studio. Uh, but when you strip away my titles, I'm really just a teacher. So thank you all for joining us tonight for this, um, our winter um, student faculty reading. Um, it's generally a, a, a situation where we have uh, a reading in January. It's kind of been a tradition. This year we held off because uh, we thought that the inauguration might be a bit of a palate cleanser. And so uh, what we have tonight are five um, stellar readers from the writer studio, students and faculty, et cetera. Um, and I just wanna tell you that this is our first webinar. Uh, we haven't, I haven't done one of these before and there are trade-offs like there are with anything else. Uh, the good thing is that I don't have to admit you, but then the bad part is I can't see you or hear you. Uh, so for instance, I could be talking to an empty room and I wouldn't know it. Um, and it also means different from a bar that the readers don't get the um, accolades and the appreciation they would get in a live room. There's no, uh, there's no uh, mosh pit either. Um, oh, thank you, Michelle. Um, so anyway, that's the difference with the webinar. Now, right from the start, I have to tell you that I couldn't have done this without Isabel DeConnick, who coached me during four sessions to get me through this thing. So it wouldn't be happening without um, Isabel. Um, now, so. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Writer's Studio, we are a small writing program that was started at 34 years ago by Pulitzer Prize winner, um, Philip Schultz. Um, we teach online and obviously now remote. We teach fiction and poetry and memoir. Uh, we have satellite programs in addition to New York that are in Hudson Valley, in Tucson, in San Francisco, and now in Rome, Italy. So we're actually all over the place. And while we teach fiction and um, and memoir and poetry, um, we also have a number of specialty classes. And at the end of this thing, I'm gonna put up some information in case you wanna know more about some of our specialty classes. Um, the Writer Studio is dedicated to teaching the craft of fiction and has a very cohesive and pragmatic methodology to help writers find their voice. And I think what you're gonna to find tonight is that the writers that are reading have very different styles. Some are fiction writers, some are poets, some memoirs. Um, but I think it gives you a range and a sense of the fact that we are um, not dedicated to one style or kind of writing. We really appreciate great writing and the craft of writing, and that's what we're doing. Um, we help people find their voice. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to introduce our first reader. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this Sally McDaniel is a writer and teacher living in Northern California. She's been taking classes at the Writer's Studio on and off since 2013. Um, Sally, can I ask you to unmute and turn on your video? Thank you. Um, I'm reading tonight, and this is my first reading ever. I'm reading from a short story just the first few pages, and the title is The Volunteer. My third day as a volunteer, I held the hand of a girl while the doctor rummaged between her legs. She'd used protection, she said, but she'd been roughed up. She didn't think he would call it rape a few months before. She said the violence had made her periods stop and she wanted the doctor to start them up again. The doctor stepped out and came back with the counselor. I returned to answering the phones. After the girl left, the details came out. She decided on an abortion, but she was too far along by a week or so for a vacuum aspiration, unless she were to travel to a different city. She'd left with the phone number of a clinic in San Jose, which it seemed was equipped differently than the facilities in our smaller city more than 100 miles to the south. In four days, she was back at the front desk. It had taken her that long to hitchhike to San Jose and back. Now she would need a different kind of abortion because the, the people in San Jose had said, no, you are even further along than you were told, too far for the suction procedure to be safe at our facility or any other. You are at least 16 weeks pregnant, they said not 13 after all. She was telling all this to the woman at the front desk, having burst in at closing time. 
The waiting room, what once had been the living room of the old house the clinic now occupied, was empty. Only the two of us were left working. I came out of the hallway where I was filing the last of the day's paperwork to stand nearby should the girl need extra support, to hold her hand again if that was what she wanted. A second trimester abortion was what she would have to have at this point. It's a bit more involved, the front desk woman informed her. With no one senior there to overhear, this woman spoke to the girl as if the problem was the girl herself. She'd been in the process of slashing yellow highlights across a flyer destined for the waiting room bulletin board. While the, while the girl stood there, she delivered a final stroke and snapped the cap back on her marker. Only, she named one of the hospitals in town, perform second trimester procedures, if that's what you want to do. The girl wanted to know their number. She took a pen from the cup on the counter and was poised to write it on her palm. The woman saying, just wait, poked around in a drawer to find a card. Four days earlier, the girl had not looked pregnant to me. And yet today in her short Indian print dress, she'd sewn it herself from a cost plus bedspread she she would later tell me. Not only her belly, but her cheeks and breasts, even her arms seemed more filled out. Some threshold had been crossed. It seemed to, be, to me now it would be a different kind of decision, if not harder then at least less obvious. I say it seemed that way to me, but my perceptions at that time, late October, 1974, and any conclusions I might've come to weren't all that reliable. Only months before, my husband, he was 29, we were both 29, had unexpectedly lost his life. I was supposed to have returned almost to myself by now, putting it all behind me because I was young. That was my mother's way of putting it. My father's words had been, no point carrying on like a wounded animal. I'd pictured a doe when he said that, taken down by a hunter such as himself. More recently, he'd compared me to a fish on a hook. The girl took the card and tucked it down the front of her dress. She asked me my name, although I wore a name tag, then drew the card back out saying, what's your number? You can reach her here should you need to, said the front desk woman. She must have had those words prepared. They came so swiftly, sweeping away in advance whatever I might have come up with to say. But I smiled at the girl, remembering even to involve my eyes in the smile. This whole time, the girl moved and spoke and looked at us with a frank matter of fact air, as if there were nothing greater to discuss or question or wonder about. She reminded me of no aspect of myself, not just because she was pregnant, which I'd never been, or because childhood was not that far behind her. It was her attitude that, that struck me. If you'd passed her on the street, your eyes might have skipped right over her. She was ordinary, unremarkable, the kind of girl who brushed her long, untrimmed hair into a ponytail once a day and forgot about it. And yet up close, you encountered this self-assured air, this, this strength of focus. No, thank you, she said when asked if she'd like to wait and see if the counselor could be reached by phone. She left the door not quite shut behind her. And when I came out onto the porch, five minutes later, there she was, lingering on the leaf-strewn sidewalk, the toe of her tall boot messing with something it had found there. The streets in this old part of town were lined with giant, overarching shade trees. It made you feel as if you were inside something to walk under them, as I did coming to and from the clinic. Sycamore, ash, valley oak, those were the ones whose names I knew, but there were others. Their roots ran everywhere along the tops of lawns and beneath sidewalks and driveways, buckling and breaking apart the concrete in places. That morning, in fact, I'd stumbled on an eruption of broken sidewalk and gone down on my hands and knees. Wake up, the sidewalk had seemed to be saying to me, not all that kindly, pay attention again. Aren't you cold? I asked the girl as I approached. It was that time of year when, as soon as the sun begins to set, you forget what it was to have been warm. 
You're the one who's been the nicest, she said. She wanted me to come with her when she had the abortion. She didn't plead, she only told me directly. She would not have needed what people then were calling assertiveness training. I said I would. It was that simple, that quick. I didn't ask about her mother or whether she had a friend. I knew I'd lost the knack for doing things for other people. Here was a chance, I must have thought, to be useful again. The wind picked up, sending tree debris floating down around us. The girl stomped on dead leaves. I could do this all day, she said. I didn't mind. The crunching sound was satisfying to me, too. But I didn't want to be standing there when the front desk woman came out and started down the steps. I had a pen in my purse, and she scraped my number in blue ink under her hand. I said I had to go, but she knew how to reach me now, and two mornings later, when my phone rang earlier than it should have, I knew it would be her. I thought you would change your mind, she said, by way of asking if I had. She gave me the appointment information and then read the address of the hospital in a careful voice. I said, try to get a lot of sleep tonight. I will, she exclaimed. I always sleep like a sunken log. I imagined it was something her family said about her, something she was known for at home. My husband had been known by those of us close to him for his way with cars. He was an expert behind the wheel, fluent, relaxed, deep in his comfort zone. Riding along with him, you would settle back into the luxury of his confidence. You would hope for the journey, whether just around town or winding up through the foothills into the Sierras or maybe out across the valley to Monterey to go on and on relaxed, in control. There was never any question with my husband's hands on the wheel of control. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Peter Krauss. Peter Krauss is a longtime teacher at the Writer's Studio, both in New York and online. And he's currently teaching an online workshop for memoir writers over the age of 50. Peter's poetry has appeared in journals including Rattle, New Verse News, Cicera, Adirondack Review, and Atlanta Review. He's also poetry co-editor of the world's recent of the school's recent anthology, The Writer's Studio at 30. Peter, if you would unmute and turn on your video, and everyone please welcome Peter Krass. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Joel and Isabel for setting up this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank the Writers Studio for being the Writers Studio. And I'd like to thank everyone out in the audience for joining us tonight. Wow, this is a big crowd, which is lovely. Uh, so I'd like to read a few poems that I've written over this crazy year we've all been through. Um, in the first two, the speaker is reacting to this new phenomenon of being indoors 23 and a half hours a day. And uh, in the first one, he's actually reduced to talking to the tree outside his window. So it's called Conversation with a Tree. Tree outside my window, how I envy you. Branches keep your distance, leaves serve as your mask. Presidents come and go, you notice only the sun, the rain, the sparrow that runs on a breeze. The seasons are your media. They never learn to lie how well you understand the truth of soil and stone, the power of roots, the reasons why the moon. All night long you sleep, undisturbed by nightmares, the morning reveals as all too real. Here at wit's end, you greet each day, you're wise. When harsh winds blow, you bend. This uh, next one, same speaker, He's really feeling it, and this is called The Fool in Quarantine. All day long, airplanes fly overhead, bearing cargo, livestock, and fools. They crowd themselves into the virus. They keep a social distance from their fear. These four walls, this floor, this ceiling make up my room. These two eyes, this mouth, this nose make up my fool. 
I speak, but the room doesn't listen. I listen, but the room doesn't speak. Tired of, tired of walls, I turn myself into that airplane. The cargo loaded, I taxi down my runway. The light turns green, my throttle cranks faster, faster. Finally, I lift off. Look, the watching people say, there goes the flying fool. Uh, the next two poems, I shift gears a bit. Um, uh, during all the craziness with politics this last year, I wondered about the founding fathers, what they think of it all. And um, I remembered that for a long time, I always thought that uh, uh, the Broadway musical should really have been about Benjamin Franklin, much cooler guy than Hamilton. So uh, I wondered what Ben Franklin would make of it all if he came back. So I've written this poem called Benjamin Franklin's Return. Stepping out onto the airliner's air stairs, he caught sight of our jeans, our t-shirts, and gasped. The jet had brought him from somewhere. His handlers weren't saying where, the past, I suppose, wherever they keep it these days. A hundred smartphones, sorry, a hundred smartphones flashed their camera lights. A blue shirted officer demanded his passport Remove your shoes, your belt, those glasses, that hat. He tried to keep his mouth from frowning, shoved both hands deep into pockets until a torn candy wrapper blew against his leg and one hand insisted on picking the strange thing up. Later, we answered his questions about the masks and why we stood so far away. He attended us with curiosity but stared blankly at the words virus and social distancing. When he asked who was president, we shuffled feet, cleared throats, changed the subject. His hands, unable to make up their minds, sprang open to receive, then snapped close like two fighting fists. Naturally, he requested a diplomat's tour of all the fine things he'd known in his time, a printing press, the post office, an insurer betting hard against a flame's angry appetite. We had to tell them they were closed, all closed by the virus, the pandemic, the plague. He stared for a long time into those great hands, stretched open like books before his paunch, then asked, but what about kites? Surely on a windy day, people must still fly kites. Please tell me, please tell me that they do. Okay, uh, the next two poems look at some of the pressure of being uh, indoors so much with other people, fortunately with other people, but uh, it can be a lot of pressure. This first one is called Angry Eyes. Like caressing a broken window's jag, but with your lips, or receiving hungry bites from a mosquito that secretly wears the sharp fangs of a tiger like holding a block of dry ice in your bare hands while it sizzles on a scalding frying pan. That's what it's like to have these angry eyes scorching a crater in the middle of your face. They're like barbed wire underpants or two electric eels, one for each glove, a mouth full of cigarette butts still glowing. When those angry eyes commence to melt your flesh, you can't sleep, you can't sing, you can't read or eat or dance. The last time those eyes glared at you, twin lasers sliced off the top of your head. You tried to speak, but with only half a brain, could barely remember your own middle name. Your mouth sputtered, I am, and the world waited for you to finish. Stop turning for a beat, then two. When nothing followed, a thousand heavy doors slammed shut. And by the time you heard the last one bang closed, a whole year had passed. Your thumb, free at last from the jam, scribbled, I'm sorry, on the table, using its own fresh blood for ink. Flip side, it's called Nevis Venus. And Nevis is a fancy word for a mole, not the animal that but uh, like a mole on your skin, a little brown spot. 
And when I discovered it was an anagram for Venus, I just couldn't resist. So, uh, Nevis Venus. Across her naked back, chocolate stars dot the midnight sky, where she asks me to scratch. Red lines mark the skin, tracing those constellations only we know. There by the scapula is the lap dog. There along the spine, the hissing cat. Over here, just above the hip, the old station wagon rolls across the heavens with its heavy load of love. Lights out, eyes sightless in the dark, my fingerprints take over, fingertips take over, brailing the pigment for its hidden message. No matter how many times I read those words, my cheeks still flush like an eager flame. Later, drifting on the flood tide of a dream, I make a mountain from her moles. First, I clamber up the mountain's steepest face. Then I rappel down the other side like a spider slipping across a silken thread. When I look back up, it's my face caught in her web. But I don't struggle as captured wasps do. I just grin, eager and ready to be her prey again. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> For my last uh, poem, I'd like to read one called Anything But Bach. That's Bach as the composer, you know, Johann Sebastian. Anything by Bach. And in this one, speaker's talking to his feet. Yeah, talking to his trees. Now he's talking to his feet. <laughs> Anything by Bach. Feet, it's better for both of us. If you can forget all the times you've gotten lost, insisting on taking the wrong direction or how you followed the same path twice, even thrice, although you knew it could never lead home. Feet, you may also want to forget how you vainly tried to follow the well-worn steps of one you admired. You were like a little boy stumbling in his father's deep footprints after a heavy snow. But feet, be sure to remember the route that led you here. It's the same road that delivered you to those who, on hearing your approach, smiled. In the rhythmic rock of your shuffle, the click clack music of your heels, they heard something even more beautiful than anything by Bach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Michelle Herman. And Michelle can only be described as a multiple threat. She's the author of an about to be published novel entitled Save the Village. She's the author of a poetry chapbook, Victory Boulevard. She's a longtime columnist who writes about life in New York's Greenwich Village. She's a veteran teacher at the Writer's Studio. And if all that was not enough, she's also a developmental editor. Michelle's poems have appeared in the Hudson Review, and she has another poem coming in the spring issue of Plowshares. Everyone, please join me and welcome Michelle Herman. I think I'm here. Okay, hi everybody. Um, big hello to my friends who are out there and especially I always like to give a shout out to my students. I see I've got past students, present students and even some near future students. So thanks for coming out. Um, so yeah, I use, I write lots of different genres. It's all words to me. It's all playing with words. So I thought tonight I'd, I'd, um, go back to my first genre, which is nonfiction. I'm going to read a, a recent column that was published in online in the village sun, which is a new website devoted to Greenwich village. Um, I want to give a big thank you to my editor, Lincoln Anderson. Um, who's run a bunch of my pieces and even some poems, which is nice. Um, so this is uh, also pandemic material. And by the way, I also want to say Sally and Peter. Oh my God, Mwah. great stuff. Um, this is a piece that I wrote back in May. It ran also in May, which is sort of pertinent because it's you know a whole different eon we were living in then. It's called Making Do With Less. I've had three showers since September. Yes, you read that right. I don't mean that as a reverse brag, and I don't mean that I've switched to baths or that I'm dirty. 
It's a long story involving a small leak that forced us to open up the wall behind our tub. That led to a total renovation of our 40-year-old bathroom, in part to get rid of the pesky step down into it that we feared an elderly person, i.e. one of us in the not too distant future, would trip over. That led to, a to, to toilet hookup complications, inspections, and a steep learning curve about how plumbing actually works. And that led to a toilet and an alarming number of shower body parts lying in wait next to my husband's desk since February. And then it was early March when the wacko plumbing quotes finally came in. We tried to find a plumber who might charge us less than five figures for one day of behind the wall work and another half day of finishing work Though I now understand that every renovation quote has to include a cushion for unseen, unforeseen complications. And then it was the middle of March, and we all began to understand that this new virus with the spikes was going to upend everything. Our solo contractor, who doesn't speak the best English, but who does good, careful work, heroically finished up all the pre-plumbing tile work he could. Then he said goodbye and got on the bus back to his home in the Catskills we canceled the plumber we had finally scheduled. We joked about the bathroom renovation that was going to take a year. The bathroom renovation, in fact, may well take a year. And it did indeed take a year. But this isn't a New York Times real estate section renovation sob story. Do not weep for us. We are fine. We are more than fine. We still have health and work. We still have a small half bath. Since September, my husband and I have washed our hair in the kitchen sink. Each morning we take turns sponge bathing in the little sink. The metal rod in the back of that sink broke off in my hand a few weeks ago and we can no longer close the drain, but we are fine. Back in late February, at the end of the old world order, we had an experience that was one of the highlights of our lives. We planned and co-hosted the monthly Groovin Cabaret show. Many happy moments stand out. One phrase haunts me. It's from the number we saved for the end because we love the song and the clarity and emotion our talented friend Mary Sue Daniels puts into it. The song is Paul Simon's American tune and the phrase is, we've lived so well, so long. Yes, we have, some of us. This is a story about people who were born into a time and milieu of outrageous, often unquestioned luxury. My husband and I are both frugal, and yet we still live so very well compared to most people on this earth. A couple of weeks ago, Nicholas Kristof's op-ed column in the Times included this statistic. According to a UN report, almost four out of 10 people in the world don't have hand-washing facilities at home. Also this, more than one third of health centers in impoverished countries don't have hand washing facilities. Every day there's a new batch of jokey articles and videos about sweatpants and dark roots and too much wine. I don't know how to reconcile these two notions of what constitutes hardship. I was born into post-war prosperity. When I was young, I took this as a birthright. I remember grousing because the central air conditioning didn't cool my upstairs bedroom as well as it cooled the downstairs. I could so easily have grown up into a bit of a princess. But I came to understand that the conditions I was born into were a random stroke of good timing. My parents were born poor and grew up in the Great Depression. If I go back to the previous two generations, the Eastern Europeans, I find nothing but cataclysm, upheaval, and making do. My parents grabbed their chance to turn the family's fortunes around. That is thanks in part to the GI Bill that allowed my father to get a college degree. That in turn allowed him to become a doctor. My newlywed parents spent most of the 1950s in Bern, Switzerland, where my father attended med school because it was cheaper than med school in the US. I still have the black and white photos they took of their apartment in a brand new subdivision of Bern there is my mother proudly posed by the miniature stove and fridge in the kitchenette. These photos puzzled me as a child. Why were they showing off these meager, barren rooms? My parents felt rich in Switzerland, living on omelets and tuna and oval maltine. They carried their groceries home in a reusable string bag called, bag called a Netsli. 
My mother wasn't eligible for a work permit, but she made a little cash sewing on her Singer featherweight for the other boys and their wives. On a good year, they could afford the long, queasy passage home on the SS Liberté to visit their parents on Staten Island, though they couldn't get back in time to say goodbye to my mother's mother before she died of leukemia. They explored Europe on a single motor scooter. They took the train to communist East Germany to see true hardship. And every Saturday evening, they got their bath right after the landlady had hers. That was the part that really got me as a kid. It seemed inconceivable to bathe once a week. Now, as I shampoo my hair once every five days in the kitchen sink, a memory bubbles up of my mother doing the same thing in our spacious suburban home. I don't remember thinking to ask her why. I also remember my general practitioner father agonizing each time he raised his office visit fee by a couple of dollars. Many of his patients were recent Greek Orthodox immigrants with few resources. When he retired in 1980, I think he was charging $22. My parents' stories about Switzerland lodged somewhere deep inside me. Now, as I watch the populace learning to make do with less, some more gracefully than others, I can't help think about the tiny European country that burned what little trash it produced to create power. My parents painted a picture of Switzerland as a Calvinist paradise made by and for frugal, modest neatniks. I have a few emigre friends from Switzerland, all artistic types, and through their eyes, I see it more as a hom homogeneous country with strong conformist tendencies. Whatever it is or isn't, I realize that it has informed many of my habits and choices. I'm perfectly clean after five minutes with a washcloth and a little soap. I use hardly any water, and it isn't always hot early in the morning. I will no doubt change my tune when the humidity settles in and we have masks clamped to our sweaty faces and surgical gloves stuck to our sweaty hands. But I'll get by. I have so much more than many. A home, my husband, my health, my kids already grown and out of the house, and running water. Occasionally, my husband and I open the bathroom door onto our frozen construction site to admire our new tiles. I feel something akin to what my forebears might have felt when indoor plumbing became the rage. Imagine that, a whole room dedicated to the cleaning and care of our bodies. Seems a little profligate. I don't think I'll go back to a daily shower. I wish for large scale good to emerge from this tragedy. And maybe that's just another luxury I can afford. We lived so well, so long, but we did it and are still doing it on the backs of others. We did it by consuming more than we needed to consume. We did it because those around us did it. We did it because it's pleasant to be comfortable. I hope now we'll think twice about the water carbon, electricity, trees, cotton, plastic, livestock. I hope we'll factor in the cashiers, hospital staff, factory workers, daycare workers, teachers, farmers, and fruit pickers who undergird the entire fragile enterprise of life on Earth in the 21st century. Thank you. And now I get to introduce my friend and colleague, Lisa Bellamy. Lisa teaches the New York City Advanced Poetry class, six-week online classes in short prose and poetry and tutorials. She is author of the wonderful The North Way, a full-length poetry collection, and the equally wonderful chapbook Nectar, which won the Aurorian's 2011 chapbook contest. Her poems and short prose have appeared in literary magazines and mainstream publications. She has received a Pushcart Prize, a Pushcart Special Mention, a Fugue Poetry Prize, an honorable mention in the year's best fantasy and horror. Lisa is currently working on new collections of poetry and short prose. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Bellamy. Thank you. Whoa, that was really powerful, Michelle. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, amazing piece. And thank you, Sally and Peter. It was great to hear you as always, Peter and Sally. And now I need to know what happened next in the story. So I don't know how I find that out, but it, that was powerful. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. My higher power. A teeny tiny lady floats in my right eye. I check in with her throughout the day. I call her Cheryl. I believe she sings. She won't shut up, just like my mother. She sits cross-legged, a yogini in my vitreous fluid. Each night, I am pleased to offer her a translucent cave for her disciplines and her austerities. Run along, dear, she trilled this bright morning. Anyone can walk on water. Waving, blowing a kiss, each time I look in the mirror. The next poem I'm going to read is called Bark Eater. It's from the Northway, which was my collection. Um, yeah. Bark eater. Yes, a snooty mohawk word for bumpkin. For yokel lacking the smarts and gumption to hunt. But I say a bark eater makes do. Consider this, a hungry traveler on a hard journey who as the pale winter sun goes down sees only trees and snow but does not lose her cool. She refuses to starve. Without hesitation, she sharpens the knife, slices a white pine and roasts the bark like a banquet of bear steak. This barren meal is hardly a tale told by an idiot. She is pleased to call it feast. Girl, my mother used to say, you always land on your feet. The bark eater toasts the dog star and asks for protection, thus surviving yet another frozen night without tears. She knows she can cry all she wants in the spring. Missy, my father used to say, just play the cards you're dealt. A bark eater spies the morning star and spits into the wind, her prayer of water and air. She doesn't need a compass. She knows she's walking north. She's traveling light. Um, so the next poem I'm going to read was published in Salamander. Um, I want to put out a plug for literary magazines, especially in this time. It's really great to, to read them, to maybe subscribe to at least one. And in general, just sort of give them a lot of love because like everyone and everybody, they're struggling. Um, I wrote this um, in the darker, well, I don't know if it's pretty dark now, but it was pretty dark um, in, the, in some dark times. Cucumber Psalm. Flourish my unwashed, unpeeled, bouncy boys. Grow citizen workers clothed in good dirt, dearest ones, I place my hope in you. Your green is king in my garden. Chopped, you are cukes in my Wisconsin mama lotion. Fluted, celebrated, bobbing and vinegar and dill, tastiest brine. Emperor Tiberius, whom Pliny the Elder called the gloomiest of men, enjoyed cucumbers every night with dinner. Yes, an attempt to self-medicate depression, but was his gloom, depression, or prophetic vision? Caligula succeeded Tiberius. Today, the sky is blue. So what? I cannot stop worrying about the Republic. When a Roman woman wanted a child, she tied cucumbers about her waist. What, you ask, do I want? Regime change. I want a sister or three, subversive, fomenting coffee clutch, chatter, plots against fascists over our gherkin salad, lopped, swished with sour cream. Dearest cukes, 
delight, nourish, fortify me. I want insurrection. So to switch gears, I'm going to read another poem from the North Way, which I wrote a few several years ago, actually, but it feels more relevant to me now, actually, than it, it did then, to be honest. Um, to my attic. In your dreamy emptiness, a sketch of a room, unfinished business, rough pine beams, plastic taped over the windows, spiders spinning in the eaves, in the corners, mouse scat like cairns, marking trails to encampments behind the walls. I would be your lone sailor, cruising your circumference. I would be your anchorite, silent as I've always wanted, like Dame Julian, who perceived God's splendor in an acorn on the floor, when alone in her cottage, she finally gave herself nothing else to look at. So Dame Julian is Julian of Norwich, who uh, was an anchorite. She was a religious um, practitioner who lived all by herself in a small room off of a church during um, the plague um, in medieval England. And her experience seems especially relevant now. Um, so I'm gonna read two more poems. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read, I now title Memoir. It was originally published um, by North American Review as part of a response to Walt Whitman. And um, I've since gotten very jealous of all the memoir writers. In the, everyone's writing a memoir in the writer's studio, including the wonderful Michelle Herman, who I see has a reading of her memoir students. So I have retooled this poem and it is a work in progress. Um, and I'm really looking forward to continuing with it. So this is chapter one, memoir. I was born from molten song. My mother was Pele, volcano goddess. She spewed and I fell into filings where my foster parents found me, 50% off, no refunds, no returns. I was born in the land of ice and snow where I slipped and fell hill after hill. No one suggested crampons and I was angry, but I cooled and now my trade is ice cutter. I was a child soldier in my mother's army. My conscription bonus, the gift of myopia. Comforting blur, best not to see too much. But don't believe our bouviacs were always mournful. Once we stormed Kunzelmanesser, furniture emporium, where my mother hoped to haggle with old Kunzelman's hapless son for a new patio set as I stymied by the shiny revolving door, wailed, hands up like a miner's child, threatened by Pinkerton's goons until I leaped. Ostensibly, I was born in Wisconsin, but who says I did not ride in on the back of the huge green and brown spotted turtle that masquerades as Isle Royal and Lake Superior. In truth, I was born in clouds and sadness, nothing less or more, gulping milk sprayed from the breasts of Cassiopeia. So that's chapter one. Right, one more poem, um, drop it. Um, the epigraph to this poem is, drop it is the foundation for all the other practices. And it's a quote by the Tibetan Buddhist teacher um, Sokni Rinpoche, drop it. And this I wrote this year during the pandemic. <clears throat> 8 p.m. I hear ambulance sirens. I try to exhale. I will ask the lizards wherever they are for protection. Tonight, I will eat creamy maple cake, sugary tarts, 
lemony, berries, cherry, and so forth. I worry, how are the children? Are they asleep? Will they sleep through the night? Though I hear the old cat wheezing and I wonder whether in this pandemic he will need to go to the vet. I will not pretend I am deaf. Though I wonder what's up each time I sneeze, my soul leaves my body when I sneeze, although so far it has always come back. I stick my head out the window, feel wind on my face, I think from the West. Of the four necessary winds, I prefer the West wind. Fierce, he rides a panther, he shouts, drop it, drop your thinking mind. Thank you. Um, so thank you everybody. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the amazing Whitney Porter, whose work I have long heard um, and admired. Uh, Whitney Porter's writing has appeared in Ping Pong, Literary Magazine, Battered Suitcase, Metazen, QWERTY Magazine, Fog Lifter, and has work forthcoming in Bayou Magazine. She is a 2016 Lambda Literary Fellow and was awarded Paragraph's 2020 Jane Hoppin Residency. Currently, she is a staff reader for Epiphany Magazine. Originally from Houston, Texas, which anyone who hears her work knows almost immediately. Originally from Houston, Texas, she now calls Brooklyn, New York her home. So please welcome Whitney Porter. And Whitney, please unmute and turn on your video. Um, I just wanted to thank the Writer's Studio and everybody. Um, this has been a really great reading and I, everybody has been really wonderful. Um, uh, it's just such an honor to read with all these great people and some of them I have known for years and years and years. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, the only thing you need to know about this short story, uh, which was published in Foglifter uh, last year, is that she is writing to an anger book, which is like her journal. So I'll just get going. Dear Anger Brook, at first as the F train rumbled between Bergen and Smith Street, I pretended not to notice the teenage girls across the way, staring, giggling, making low comments that I couldn't quite make out. I could guess what was being said in fierce hot whispers between them. I didn't be, need to be told I was different Yet it was often perplexing to me how people felt the need to tell me so. That I looked like the kind of woman that would like to sleep with other women. As if these pearls of wisdom given out by total strangers had never screamed out at me in their many iterations in various hallways in junior high, high school, and college. Hollered from highways, expressways, pedestrian passageways, dirt roads, commuter roads, feeder roads, cracked sidewalks, and nature trails. Trails, catawalled from economy cars, moving pickup trucks, sedans, U-Hauls, bicycles, big wheels, and mobility scooters, as if I was completely unaware of my aversion to Dick all this time, and that upon the slur-filled shouts, screams, whispers, and murmurs, I should feel the sting of the insult, as if it were an insult, as if wanting to fuck a woman was a bad thing and not the best thing ever. Dyke, one of them cracked under her breath her gaze hidden behind a curtain of greasy black bangs, her, her face so pale she looked practically translucent, save for the rosy clusters of acne across her cheeks. It was before 2 p.m. Tuesday on a cold January day. I was sitting on an empty train car safe for the teenagers, heading home from a particularly grueling waitering shift at my corporate dining room job in lower Manhattan. I was still wearing my polyester tux underneath my parka, a stain of goose pate encrusted on the lapel. The train had just come out of the tunnel and we were now above ground. Winter had layered New York City's littered streets with a beautiful sheet of white. I love these times in New York when it looked to me like a beautiful and immaculate baby just before christening, white gowned and serene, clean and quiet, angelic and swaddled, all of its shit tucked away in a gleaming white diaper of snow. 
But soon my brief reverie was interrupted. I sniffed at something that smelled like strawberries, but was not strawberries. A shopping mall kiosk aberration of strawberries. Yo, I love this shit, one of the teenagers said. Between moments of spritzing strawberry scented toxins in the air and giggling rapidly at their phones, the teenagers intermittently continued to discuss the overwhelming probability of my gayness while passing around a blue slushy like a bong at a rave. I mean, she's like wearing a suit. I have a question in your book. Who drinks a slushy in the middle of winter? I am not intolerant of stupid people. I have many acquaintances and family that are stupid and I managed to talk to them and engage with them as if they are real people. I have even been able to love stupid people, love them as if they were smart. In fact, loving them so much that I did not realize they were stupid until I did not love them anymore. But sitting there on that bone chilling afternoon, what came to my mind looking at these young girls sipping on a frozen beverage while passing the snow capped wasteland of the Gowanus was the question, had someone loved these stupid girls? Like I had loved stupid girls in the past, not calling out stupid for what it was, therefore being complicit in the stupid. As a train crossed over the Gowanus Canal, I stared down at the huddled gray warehouses, the lump of sand looking like lumps of sand looking like enormous white sand castles next to ice dusted dump trucks and cement mixers, all set along the icy brown waters of the Gowanus. How miserable they all looked, stuck out in the cold, stranded tinny strict tinny structures born into misery. Then I looked at these girls as they sat squeezed together, rumpled in their winter layers, sipping on their frozen blue beverage. The girl with the greasy black bangs took a strenuous sip of slushy, pulled the cup back and held her head. Why is this so cold? I stared on valiantly, trying not to make eye contact, but so wanting to make eye contact to see what her face looked like when she said stupid things, to stare into her pale, transparent head, view her walnut-sized brain as she fathomed out why ice was so cold, the ponderous and helpless expressions, the world such a perplexing and confusing place. What is it with physics, yo? Why are lit matches hot? Why is a waiter's tip of five pennies at the bottom of a half-eaten milkshake sticky? Why do eggs thrown onto a car's surface ruin the paint job? Why do large bricks of cement drop from an overpass onto oncoming traffic just for fun have the weight and capacity to kill? Why are human beings between the ages of 13 and 18 such sociopathic shits, the mysteries of the universe? I mean, I mean, what the fuck, said the greasy bang girl, no doubt believing she had given herself an icy embolism. She pulled her hair away from her eyes and <clears throat> I saw they were brown and earnest. A stream of tears ran roughshod down her pimply face. She looked so young and, and helpless that I almost felt sorry for her. Almost. Oh my God, it hurts, she said, handing over the slushy, then holding her head between her hands. I watched the other two girls laugh as they sadistically slapped the shoulder and back of the girl with the greasy black bangs, her face going from ghostly to cherry red. The girl showing the same lack of compassion I'd expected in the 30 minutes I had known them. As they back slapped and whinnied the greasy bang girl into submission, I imagined the doors opening and depositing each onto the third rail as karma should dictate. I made eye contact and I know I shouldn't have anger book, but I did. Yo, I think she likes us. They laughed in anger book, even though I had only recently imagined each of them falling onto the train tracks and being electrocuted in some gruesome way that would light their hair on fire. Their laughter gutted me. What I couldn't understand sitting on this empty train was what was so funny. Anger book, I am someone who is not averse to the occasional comedy. I get jokes and I can laugh at myself. I can be funny and I find things funny. Here's a joke for you. Anger book, how many lesbians does it take to change a light bulb? Punchline, that's not funny. I'm not that lesbian. I think that joke is hilarious. The train approached Smith and Ninth Street. The sunshine through the train window passed along my face, and it felt so good to be warmed on a day that had reached the pinnacle of 22 degrees Fahrenheit. I looked out the window. I found the snow had turned the grim Gowanus horizon and its filthy syphilis imbued ruin of a canal into a kind of winter wonderland. And even though I felt a psychosomatic rash coming on as I normally did as I passed over the Gowanus, 
there was an unusual touch of optimism that I generally don't feel when I'm passing over a super fun site. And as the train pulled in, there was a sense of well-being that I hadn't felt since this, this miserable winter season had begun prematurely in November. The girls became distracted by something on one of their phones. All of them gathered to the one like bees over a trash can. Feeling the safety in their distraction, I reluctantly began to read a book. I'd packed in my bag specifically for moments like these, something to distract me from the misery of the world. But it was Russian and it was dense and sad and complex, which made me sleepy. My eyes drifted closed, but soon I was awoken to the slap of something cold and wet upon my face. I opened my eyes, every part of me was covered in blue. The teenagers had just stepped out of the train. The doors were closing and greasy bangs smushed her face against the window, amplifying a constellation of inflamed pimples. Then she pulled her face back and stuck her tongue out between her two fingers, the tongue touching the glass, leaving a smear of saliva, the international sign of cunnilingus demonstrated upon a dirty subway window. I looked down at my hands now covered in blue, so steeped in food coloring, it might never come out. I had no words, me who had words for everything, for stubbing my toe on the subway st station door jam, gum popping, loud cell phone conversations, the eating of egg sandwiches of any kind, anywhere, for shit shitheads who lean their entire backs onto subway poles meant for hands, for people who hum, for leg spreaders and antsy children who laugh too hard at nothing, for sno smooching couples having way too intimate conversations. Well, I think you should have pulled out, Bobby. Now what are we going to do? For people entertaining the for people entering the train carrying an amplifier in one hand and a microphone in the other, for the accordion players, the mariachis, dancers, and terrible guitar, sitar, banjo, and ukulele players, and whatever awful entertainment that can be had on the subway against our wills. But I had no words for this. No words for the international sign of cunnilingus, the smushed blue tinge tongue against a subway window, glass fogged with breath, a mark a smear. Thank you.